I'm Jess. I'm a herpetologist. That means I study reptiles and amphibians like turtles and frogs and snakes and toads. Right now, I'm in Montreal near the Red Path Museum where I'm a PhD candidate at McGill University. But most of the time when I'm doing my science, I look a little more like this. You might wonder what I'm doing spending so much time in this swamp. Well, aside from having a great time, um, this swamp is located in Long Point, Ontario, where an endangered species that I study lives. This species is the phallus toad, and I study their tadpoles, how those tadpoles change the environment they live in, and what could happen if we lose them. So let's take a look underwater of the swamp to take a closer look at what I study. Frog and toad tadpoles are really cool because they act very differently than the adults. Tadpoles live in the water, breathe using gills, kind of like fish do, and eat mainly algae, making them herbivores or omnivores. But adult toads live on land, breathe air with lungs like we do, and eat bugs, making them carnivores. So they act totally different. And some people say that losing one species of frog or toad is akin to losing two, because the adults and the baby stage or the larval stage, these tadpoles, act so differently. This means they probably have different effects on the environment as well. But despite this, the tadpoles get really overlooked because they're small, they're just the baby stage of the older animal, and they don't exist for a very long time. They're only in the pond until they reach metamorphosis when they become a little tiny frog or toad. So really, they've been overlooked. The average fowler's toad can lay 4,000 eggs in a clutch, meaning thousands of tadpoles are in this pond at a time. Because these ponds usually don't have any fish, the tadpoles are the main form of vertebrate biomass in the ponds. So they probably have a really big effect on the environment. But despite this, we really don't know what they do in the ponds, which means you can't know what the consequence of their loss could be. And that's not a theoretical question because we are losing these species at an alarming rate. With the current data that we have, amphibians are the most threatened group of vertebrates on the planet. So it's important to know what they do in the environment to both better push for their protection and to know what could happen if they disappear. When you find out there's something we don't know or a question that we can't answer, that's really exciting as a scientist because that means that you could be the one to figure it out. And so that's where I come in and that's what I study. I study this question that we don't know the answer to right now, which is how do these tadpoles affect their environment? And I do this using these mesocosms here that have hundreds of little tadpoles swimming around in them. I look at how these ponds change when toad tadpoles are present and when they're absent. I do my science using mesocosms and mesocosms mimic natural ponds. They're kind of a middle ground, that's what meso means. And so they have more control than if you were doing this experiment just in the wild. So you can actually tell what's going on, you can actually see what's changing things. But they are also more complex and have are more realistic naturally than, than a lab experiment. So my mesocosms mimic the natural environment that the toads live in. They have the same aquatic communities. They have the same substrates of sand on the bottom, same amount of oxygen and nutrients so that they can act as much like a natural community as possible, but I can still tell what's going on in them. In some of these mesocosms, I have tadpoles and in some of these mesocosms, I don't. So that I can look at the difference between the two and see how the environment changes when the tadpoles are there or not. In this mesocosm I am opening, there's no toad tadpoles. But in this mesocosm I am opening, there's a hundred toad tadpoles. Do you see the difference? In mesocosms without toad tadpoles, there's a lot more algae. Um, and that's what's making it so much more green. So how is this happening? So the toad tadpoles eat that algae. And there's two kinds of algae. Algae that grows on surfaces, that's called periphyton, and it's the toad's favorite food. And algae that floats around in the water, that's called phytoplankton. And the toads will eat that too. And remember, there's lots of tadpoles in a pond, which means they eat lots and lots of algae. And this helps keep the water clear. 
When the tadpoles aren't in that pond, there's nothing that functionally replaces them. They're not functionally redundant. That means that another species like a snail or another kind of tadpole can't come in and do exactly what they did in the pond. So nothing else is coming and eating all of this algae. That means that it grows and it grows and it grows. And this turns the water green. So here's a reminder of what that looks like. It can be a really dramatic difference. And that's great in the mesocosm that we can see this really big difference. But what we really want to know is how this might work in natural ponds that we want to apply the experiments to. So does this happen there too? And it does. Here's two natural ponds not far from where the mesocosms are. This one has thousands of toad tadpoles in it, and it's pretty muddy, but that's normal. And there's not too much algae in it. And in this pond, there's no toad tadpoles in it. And you can see how much more green it is and how much more algae there is in that pond. I measure the amount of algae that's in these ponds um, and in my mesocosms using my very scientific equipment of a toothbrush and a turkey baster. And then I bring that data back to the lab um, where I have to work under green light. The algae degrades under white light. And so I work in the dark under green light and look quite a bit like a mad scientist. Algae can discourage other animals from using these ponds. And while not all ponds in a landscape will have toad tadpoles to eat this algae, some should. If we lose the tadpoles from a landscape due to pollution, habitat loss, and or disease in either the tadpoles or the adults, then all the ponds could look like this. That would negatively affect both the animals that live in the ponds, as well as the ones that come to drink, swim, or wade in these ponds. And that's only one example I've found of how these toads influence their environment. Um, they change it in a lot of different ways. And so they're very important to these habitats and to all the other species around them that use these habitats as well. Um, and so we know they're important. We know that we're losing them. Um, we know that that's bad. And so don't worry, I'm helping them out. I've always really loved reptiles and amphibians and I've always wanted to help conserve them. So this part is really special to me. I've developed methods to raise these tadpoles with 90% survivorship to metamorphosis. Um, and we also release them as head started tadpoles like I'm doing now or as tiny toadlets. Head started an animal means that you raise it to a certain point so it has a better chance of survival when you release it. So these tadpoles were head started to a stage in their development where they are bigger and less fragile and they're eating really voraciously. So they're likely to do well in the wild where we're putting them back. And we put them back um, where we found their parents. And so it's where they would have naturally been. And these toadlets we've raised past the tadpole stage to when they are tiny toads. This is my favorite part of the field season when we get to release the little toadlets that we've worked so hard to raise. We've released thousands of these little tadpoles and toadlets now with the hopes that when they grow up and make tadpoles of their own, they'll continue to contribute to a healthy environment. Just raising a whole bunch of little toadlets and tadpoles and then releasing them though, isn't enough to save the toads. I can raise as many tadpoles and toadlets as I want, but if there isn't a suitable environment for them to go back into, they're not gonna be able to not be endangered anymore. They're still gonna be in trouble and the environment is still gonna need our help. And so the point of releasing all of these animals wasn't just that we'll put so many back into the environment that suddenly it'll be okay again. The point was actually to maintain the population of the toads at such a level that should the environment return to a state when the toads could use it, that there would be enough toads left to take advantage of that. And Long Point is a very dynamic system. It's a sand spit. It changes all the time as Lake Erie moves the sand around. And from 2016 to 2019, the lake was rising, causing there to be less beach with almost no beach in 2019. The rising lake also eroded away the dunes, making them like cliffs for the toads. And it made the once shallow, warm, sandy marsh where the toads like to breed deep and cold. So the toads couldn't use it. This was combined with the worsening presence of a plant called Phragmites, which is invasive. That means it's not supposed to be in Canada. 
and it filled in the ponds that the toads used to breed. The loss of the beach to toads hunt on and soak up water on, the dunes where they bury themselves during the day and hibernate, and the marsh where they breed was bad news for the toads. But in 2020 and 2021, massive storms rolled into Long Point. They knocked down the cliff like dunes. They pushed back the sand and buried the invasive plants and made these shallow, warm, sandy ponds that the toads really liked all over the landscape. And the toads found them and they did use these ponds. Hear that? It kind of sounds like a crying child, or some people call it a dying sheep, or a graduate student whose research isn't going well. But it's actually the mating call of the Fowler's toad. It's a really beautiful sound to us because for years they didn't really call. And these tadpoles here are very special. They are the first fully wild clutch of Fowler's toad tadpoles that we know of since 2017. I didn't breed their parents. I didn't raise them. These toads exist all on their own. So it's working. The toads are doing so much better. And now we can see hundreds of toadlets a night on our surveys. And we're filled with so much hope for these little toads. I love my work. And I'm living my dream, getting to study these animals I really care about and how they influence their environment and even helping to conserve them. But it wasn't easy to get here. I've had a lot of people tell me that I shouldn't be here from when I was a little kid playing in the mud to now when I'm still playing in the mud. Um, but all of those people were wrong and nothing about me being a girl, being bubbly, being emotional, doing my outreach makes me anything less than a brilliant scientist. I don't do this work alone. I work with a really wonderful group of people, many of whom don't look like a stereotypical scientist either. I believe that science is for everyone. Um, and I'm very passionate about equity, diversity, and inclusion in science. I'm the chair and co-founder of STEM Diversity at McGill, an initiative that promotes underrepresented groups in science. We have a website <laughs> that features um, interviews with underrepresented groups and those in leadership positions in STEM, and you can check it out right here. We also have a lesson plan, a mentorship program, and a coloring book that features activities from draw yourself as a scientist type of activities to activities featuring the research of underrepresented groups in STEM. I wrote and illustrated this coloring book, and it's free. You can request your digital copy here. I'm also the president of the Graduate Association of the Red Path Museum. And we love to promote our diverse and really wonderful student body and all the work that they do. So you can check out our stories and our research over here in our student showcases. I also really love to give outreach talks to community groups um, and schools and other organizations to learn all about my toads or my story. And so you can check those out through Skype a Scientist, Canadian Herpetological Society's Toad Talks, Hot Science School Talks, the Red Path Museum, or you can just contact me here and I'm happy to chat with any of you. So thanks so much and I hope you all go out in the mud and follow your own passions in science. Bye.